Welcome to the Uncomfortable Conversations podcast, the untold stories of the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community. I'm your host, Guru Nishan. If you would like to support this podcast, I'd encourage you to make a donation at gurunishan.com slash uncomfortable conversations. And I want to thank you to all the listeners who are sharing the podcast uh, with other people that you know. Please subscribe and review the podcast on your favorite podcasting platform. As always, at the beginning of every episode, I like to read the intentions for why I started this podcast. Number one, to break the veil of silence that is long permeated and continues to strangle the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community in the name of neutrality. Number two, to validate and help clarify the complex feelings of those who have joined this lifestyle, who were born and raised into it, and or who have practiced or taught Kudalini Yoga. Number three, to encourage active listening to uncomfortable conversations from this community as a revolutionary act of self and collective healing. Number four, to let survivors know that we see them, we believe them, we love them, and we will fight for their truth to be addressed. Number five, to let teachers who are denying, gaslighting, or spiritually bypassing know that what they are doing is willfully ignorant and re-traumatizing victims. Number six, to illuminate the inherent racism, homophobia, cultural appropriation, and exploitation that perpetuates the teachings, the 3HO lifestyle, and the overall community ethos. Number seven, to stop the perpetuation of gaslighting and victim shaming by naming it for what it is. Number eight, to dismantle internalized shame, guilt, toxic positivity, and lightwashing mentality. Number nine, to honor all of the parts of ourselves that have been forgotten or silenced. Number 10, to honor each and every body that has come th through this community, both named and unnamed. And number 11, to encourage people to do their own research, to process their own emotions, to get somatic therapy and other therapy and support as needed, to draw your own conclusions and to be critical thinkers rather than to just blindly follow anyone. Please remember that your story matters. Please share it when you're ready. We're here to listen and to support you. I want to welcome today's guest to the podcast. Her name is Beth Van Dam, also known as Sat Atmakar. Beth joined the Los Angeles Kundalini Yoga community in 2007 while at grad school earning her MFA in production design for film and TV at the American Film Institute. She discovered gold and became a regular student there. And quickly saved our and a part-time front desk manager and ultimately a full-time front desk manager. She took level one teacher training in 2013-14 with Guru Mook and Guru Shabad and also attended level one yoga therapy training with Guru Dadam of England, Sweden, New York in 2014 at Golden Bridge. She also assisted three other level one teacher trainings, two at Golden Bridge, Santa Monica, one at Golden Soul, and taught at Golden Soul Studio in LA from 2014 to 2019. She also organized a level two yoga therapy module with Guru Dadam at Guru Ramdas Ashram in 2015 in Los Angeles. 
She attended Summer Solstice in New Mexico every year from 2013 through 2019, where she managed the tent setup crew. In, in 2020, she ended a five plus year long personal saving commitment for Gramuk. She also no longer practices or teaches Kudalini yoga. Today, she has a radical and fulfilling career working as a set director, creative carpenter and artist and designer in Hollywood and beyond. Beth, I want to welcome you to the podcast. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> Good evening, Sean. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to um, have you coming forward and, and sharing uh, your experience with us. And I want to ask you just to start us off. Why do you feel it's important to share your story? Um, yeah, there hasn't been a lot of light shed on the LA community, except for, you know, the heat that has been coming around uh, Katie uh, and the Rama Institute, um, Guru Jagat. And so I have actually also spoken to folks from the Southern California Public Radio. They were doing a story about that. Um, about like kind of around Rama. And um, I got linked into that through um, Sandeep Morrison and um, was part of the thing I wanted to talk to them about was like, there's, she's just a little part of the story. <laughs> and so I really, um, I'm, a, I'm a good friend of Jules, you know, full disclosure. <laughs> um, and she's, you know, took a different path than I did. Um, and so I guess I want to try to shed some light on the other side of the story a little bit from my perspective. Also, um, I think that the ways that Kundalini Yoga is still working in the community are a little bit dangerous. Um, and it was for me. Um, I think that Kundalini Yoga is taught as though it's for everyone. And it isn't, um, you know, it's taught that you're like clearing karma from past lifetimes and this lifetime and that you're doing all this emotional processing and that there's all this kind of clearing that is happening and it doesn't, it's not, it's not happening. And the way that it's being sort of perpetuated as this system that is doing the work that is really like something you should be doing with a therapist is bad to me. I find it really bad. I also have a lot of friends who are sort of still clinging to their practice that are um, that use Kundalini Yoga to get sober. And I think that it's probably best suited for addict behavior types because it gets you high and it's also really ungrounding and in the teacher trainings I've witnessed some people going through psychotic breaks. I had a very close friend um, do a complete, they needed to be hospitalized um, from a psychotic break during getting involved with that. And um, so I think it has a lot of risks. Mm -hmm. So to me, Kundalini Yoga should come with a warning label and so I also have that aspect to share about it, not just, you know, what I went through or the drama of Golden Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> there was. Sure, right? <laughs> um, so thank you for all of that. I think you just really summed up so many important um, pins that, that this episode is going to cover, you know, one in that uh, a lens into Golden Bridge and, and you referred to Jules, the last two episodes we did on the podcast. Uh, Jules got to give give her lens into this kind of period of time. You get to come in into the same period of time, but from your your lens and specific to the dedication you had at Golden Bridge and, and Guru Muk specifically, which we haven't heard a lot about, right? So I right. I appreciate that voice coming here, and also the aspect of the propelling machine that is Kundalini Yoga carrying on and selling itself to this population as a trauma informed. Uh, healing place when really it's actually could be and many of us have testimonies that it's actually the opposite of that it's actually freezing those over and not allowing us to to really address things that we should be doing with our therapist so exactly. all of that golden nuggets here and let's go uh, where okay. are we to begin <laughs> well I like wrote up this crazy detailed timeline and I was 
I mean, I still have all my emails from all of those periods. So I could like pinpoint exact dates and I'm like, oh my God. And it, it's probably more than what we really need to cover some of it, but I did start getting involved um, in 2007 when I moved to Los Angeles to uh, attend grad school. And I lived really near the um, Arclight Cinema, which is where the second location of Golden Bridge was. And um, it was this gorgeous space with like this kind of wooden arcing ceiling. And there was this um, tea shop, like Ron Tea Gardens, Dragon Herbs. And there was, you know, this cool gift shop, this fabulous organic food, you know, deli, cafe, bakery situation, lots of music, CDs. There was um, a Native American healer, Sarah Eagle woman there. They had like this healing sort of spa thing called Amrit Dava um, with an osteopath and acupuncturist and like healing facials. And it was like the whole thing. I'm like, wow, this is like all of the place, everything you want, like all in one place. And I was riding my bike. I used to ride my bike a ton around uh, Los Angeles and I passed by there and I started going to the cafe, like the cafe you could buy by the pound at the time, like, you know, Indian food that was really delicious and salads and things. And there was a whole thing going on there. Um, and a lot of the turbans, I was like, what in the world? And I had before I lived in Minneapolis before LA and I had done quite a bit of yoga, like Ashtanga, you know, various Hatha styles. Um, probably I got the most out of Ashtanga, I think, but also I was really involved with um, praying mantis kung fu. And I got like really deeply involved with that for a while. And so, you know, having a physical practice was like a thing that was important to me. And at some point I was like, I've been here enough times, I should probably try a class, you know? And, um, so I went to the front counter and I discovered that they had Kundalini yoga and I had only ever heard about that in a magazine, like an interview with Madonna. So um, I was like, what the hell, you know, let's check this out. <laughs> like come to find out that the Ray of Light album is like when Gurmukh was working with Madonna, like that whole period of our career. <laughs> Didn't know any of that. Like I wasn't like, my whole, you know, the story that Jules tells about Hollywood, it just like kind of, you know, oh my God, Russell Brand was there and there's Amy McAdams and, you know, Demi Moore and all these, like, I didn't, that wasn't really like, I was like, holy cow, the Oracle of the Dalai Lama of Tibet is coming to this place. Like, this is really, wow. Like, I don't really know a lot of celebrities like I wouldn't recognize them I checked Orlando Bloomin and I got like mad at him one time when he wasn't paying I didn't know who he was like I didn't <sighs> meaning it's you like, didn't have celebrity culture in I life. didn't <laughs> I wanted to work in movies but behind the camera and so like I had a sort of different relationship anyway um, I was using my student loan money to go to classes and eventually I found out about the SEVA program when I was like getting, you know, I started asking. And so I was quickly inducted into the SEVA program. And um, I'm, and like at that time, I think this was now like 2008, you know, Gurmukh, she said to the person who was in charge, like, she's got something, we have to get her more involved. She probably saw my like, get to it attitude, you know, my grandmother, like, do it now. <laughs> um, Midwest mentality. Anyway, um, so she but kind of picked me and brought me into the staff. So there was always this like, energy of like, oh, Gurmukh's my teacher because she chose me. Like, they kind of carried me like throughout the whole rest of my time. <laughs> All the way through to 2020, um, basically. But um, Let, let's pause you there and just really just highlight some of what you just said. When you're coming in, you're you're aware that Gurmukh had taught, and that, that there's celebrities in this room. There's a, been a lineage of her teaching 
celebrities because Madonna had been a one. What you just pointed I out, I found was out Rhea. later. Yeah. So, so once you were already in the Golden Bridge culture, that's what you found out that this is kind of like a regular thing. She had done uh, pregnant yoga with different celebrities, right? And how, right. So you had learned that, but it was more fascinating to you about the Dalai Lama and the the spiritual culture that Golden Bridge represented. It was organic food. It was everything holistic. It was understanding from naturopath to you know all these different spectrums of whether it was spiritual or physical, but it was all about this holistic health and and even though you were involved in Hollywood you were more on the production side of things so it wasn't so much you were oohed and awed by the celebrity culture of scene. I mean I if I knew I would have been but I wasn't even the type of person to pay attention to that yeah. You didn't know who the people were so they were just an average person to you but somebody else could have recognized them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you start getting involved and then um, being selected by Gurmuk had that kind of aura to it was like wow that's so special because right. and so you learning that was a part of like by being chosen like other people are letting you know like oh this is this is one right this is special. yeah it's like <laughs> you have to know this is a high honor you know like that whole thing um and you know the, her teaching style was kind of different back then um the very first class that i ever had with her like she did a tantric meditation and she didn't often do that like she never does it anymore but we had to hold our hands up to a partner and some random dude that was sitting next to me you know because i didn't know anyone else that was there and it wasn't going you know with a friend or anything and we had to chant like back and forth wahe guru and hold our hands up for 31 minutes and i've done like some very challenging physical type of practices <laughs> before in my life but like i was like oh my god i've never held my hands for 31 minutes like in the air just like that and it was so compelling and so bizarre and i just kind of like burst like one little tear out of each eye i was like i did it you know this kind of like energy of victory that was always sort of around and she kind of carried that whole that's a big theme and all, all, all of her and a lot of the teachers styles um so that was sort of like what really really hooked me in um and then when I graduated AFI I had um in 2009 I had a terrible rape experience in a bathroom uh, on a, at a house party and it was really awkward. And, um, the, I didn't know this person that did that, but it was obviously the friend of the host. It was like a graduation party for like graduating with a master's of fine art. And this is what happens. My parents are visiting me. I drove myself home. Um, no one asked me if I was okay. Everyone kind of knew something had happened. Um, it like still haunted me for quite a while. And the very next day I'm like driving my parents around Los Angeles and like having suicidal ideation of like just crashing myself off the highway bridge. And, you know, but I was like, nope, we're in the car. We're going to go to the art museum. And it was, that was rough. I had a lot of challenging sort of mental picture images after that period of time. I was trying, I don't know, I like had a sort of more sexually free period of my life, I guess. And so there was like this part of me that was like, oh, did I choose that? But it wasn't. <laughs> that wasn't. And so I had a hard time and like, uh, I had a hard time clinging to this energy that I had been victimized. And what I ended up doing a lot was sort of squarely framing myself away from victimhood towards victory, like by using Kundalini yoga to work through all these things. And there I am in Shavasana having like these memories popping up and I'm going, you know, and at this point Tej didn't really she started teaching kind of like right when I started um, at Golden Bridge because she was first Gurmuk's assistant. And so I was part of her first group of students and she kind of got more comfortable. Like the classes weren't huge. They were just normal. Um, 
And she on Tuesdays would do this, the 9 a.m. class, because Gurmuk always would do the weekend classes. And Tej was doing some of the week morning classes. And then she on Tuesdays would also have an 11 a.m. that was sort of this deep meditation class. It was like advanced meditation. I forgot the name. But I always like made it a kind of a regular point to try to be there, like to go to both of her classes for the Tuesday. And so she was kind of an early part of my story. Um, and she at the time was also um, doing these um, like their uh, counseling sessions. They were $108 and you know, oh, I got a session from Tasia. And eventually I got one. And I think I was just kind of questioning what, you know, was happening to me. I, I'm, I started grad school late. Like I was 35 when I started. I had this rape experience when I'm 37. And I'm like, what is happening? This is supposed to happen when I'm in my early 20s. Like, how did this happen? And so, um, Anyway, I had this session with Tej and um, it was interesting and she had some points and she also had some really kind of helpful things to say about my mother and her health journey. Um, my mother died about five or so years ago and she was in the beginning of her decline and um, and I, like she helped me see that I needed to just let my, like. I couldn't tell her to change her diet and do all these things and try to see a different holistic doctor along with her Western doctor. Like she did help me sort of recognize that I had to let her be on her own path. And it really opened up a big area of friendship between me and my mom. So I have that to thank her for. Um, but then in the second half of this session, it's like an hour long, she started telling me about my childhood and my childhood was really traumatic and it didn't happen to me. I don't know who it happened to. And I started kind of recognizing like this lady is projecting her whole story onto me. And what is this? I don't even know what this is. And I kind of like red flags started going up and it was really weird. And I like politely said like, oh, thank you so much for this session. And I hear I found all the emails last night. I'm like, oh my God. So I had some flags about like what kind of person Tej was, I guess. Um, at that point, um, and also Hari Jiwan was teaching occasionally. And when I graduated from AFI, I started getting more involved again with the yoga, obviously, and trying to, you know, be victorious in my life. And um, I had a couple of friends who were really only in wanting to go to Hari Jiwan's classes. And because he had already kind of started his little entourage at that point, there would be like, you know, there's all these tables in the cafe and people would hang out there on their laptops all the time and, you know, set up their plans for world domination. And, you know, then they would all like go collect their hang out for a while and then collect off and go do their thing. And I, they were like kind of trying to sniff me out to maybe be part of that group for a little while. And um, at one point in class, I remember Hari Juwan just like locking onto me, like, I'm doing yoga, I'm doing my, you know, ego eradicator, I'm doing all the things, I'm doing my stretch pose, I'm, and he did not take his eyes off of me. And it felt really bad. Um, it felt really rapey. And I was a little triggered by that. <laughs> And I, I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't figure it out. And then later I found out that he does this thing called face reading. This is many years later, I kind of found out that he does this thing and that he had been taught it. And I don't know if YB taught him or somebody taught him like <clears throat> how to do this face reading, but that was bad. And I kind of stopped going to his classes, to be honest. Like I didn't go to his daytime classes or his evening afternoon classes. Like he would do these rebirthing gong sessions because they had, you know, Golden Bridge is famous for having its movable walls. And in this iteration, they also had them. So they would open up and turn it into this huge room. 
And that's also where Grimlock would do like, you know, Easter morning, Sunday class and, you know, Christmas Eve and all the New Year's Eve party celebrations. And Harry Jiwon started being into the gong and he had his little gong album coming out then. And, um, and he would do these gong rebirthing workshops. And so I would go to those and this is also where it's like, oh, you're going to go through the tunnel of your, the birth canal and you're going to relive like every negative moment that ever happened to into your life. And you're going to like swim through and you're going to go through and you're going to do all these things and you're going to clear everything, like starting from the second of your birth to the second of now. And this is like what, oh my God, I'm going to be fixed, you know, like, <laughs> So I was doing Seva for like, I was getting paid as a manager, but I was doing Seva for all these events, like every single thing, including, I got to say this, I did my teacher training for free. I did my level one and level two yoga train yoga therapy modules for free. I mean, I worked my ass off. <laughs> a lot of people got really deeply invested. I did pay money for white tantric. I did pay money to go to some Guru Dave sessions, um, but I did not spend a lot of money doing this practice. I just spent a lot of personal time and energy and sweat. Um, so, so there's that. <laughs> it was your sweat equity, sounds like. A lot of sweat I, equity. <laughs> I would love to hear like when you were talking about like getting pulled into the Seva work crew, what that really meant from a Guru Mukh, Guru Shabbat perspective within the framework of Golden Bridge. Um, and, and I hear that you maximized your Sevadar potential to be able to get as many of your trainings <laughs> for free, where a lot of people actually paid for trainings and were Sevadars. So there's all right. ranges of right. the, the, the Sevadar experience, but I appreciate what you're saying that you actually got training certifications by dedicating yourself to supporting some of these trainings. And okay. I know that you can also give us a lens into what made Golden Bridge what it was. Like you painted a little bit of a picture of this incredible atmosphere that just kind of became the holistic place to be. Yeah. And that's beautiful. The, the wood itself was beautiful. The atmosphere itself was enchanting. And so it was a place within this jungle called Los Angeles that you could go to and kind of feel like you were connected. And then Gurmuk has that persona too with her chuni. And then she has this very soft voice but she can be very hard and oh, penetrating. Yeah, total hard ass. And so give us a sense of like what it meant to become a part of that Save It Our staff yeah. and, and what you want to illuminate into that. I guess it would maybe be helpful to sort of like, because, you know, at some point the dynamics shift, you know, obviously we moved to a new studio. That's the one where Jules got involved. And then we, you know, Tej and her one leave. Like, but at this point in time, Gurmukh would, there would be like a weekly, um, you know, email that would get sent out about what's happening at the studio. And she would do a video, like a video broadcast. And it might be like a meditation. Often it was a meditation or it might be, you know, uh, try this recipe or just some wisdom about whatever. But like, there was this kind of persona that was being projected. Like I have some wisdom to share and it was always the top of the email and then everything else came after and you know here's the link to the image of the pdf for this meditation and i like help me watch me do it for this amount of time or whatever it was so there was this there was an aura of celebrity that you know and she was sort of like on the bench teaching and talking about this you know so-and-so famous somebody or other Courtney Love or somebody that you know was a stubborn student at one point and what it was like to work with them and I remember teaching them this and that and it's just like this kind of like you know war stories of working with the rich and famous kind of vibe that was sort of always part of her spiel um but the thing with Gurmukh was um that she was a real ass kicker like she would make you work <laughs> which I liked. Um, and also her husband, Guru Shabbat, started teaching more and he was never really like the guy who wanted to be, he let Gurmukh have the celebrity position um, and he was great, strong support for her and kind of running the business. Um, but 
and he kind of had like a side thing going with some real estate. So he had some other interests, but he started teaching and I started going to his classes and I actually really liked his classes because he didn't talk. Like he would, he would just let you have the experience. Hari Juan would talk the entire time about this movie that just came out, about this news, about this. And he'd tell you exactly how to feel during the whole entire experience. Mm -hmm. And like, there was styles that I really just didn't connect to. Like, I, uh, I, I appreciated a little more of just giving space for it to happen. And, um, and Tej was, she would make you work, but there was this kind of like subtle, soft energy. And she's kind of like this funny granny, you know, and a little sort of strange in the face. And, you know, there's like, she's so unassuming, but as I kind of got to know her more, like she would really be an angry lady. And she had this string of people that would um, be kind of her best person for a little while and then they were kicked out and there's a few uh, uh, I first noticed it with this woman that was on staff when Tay started teaching it felt like it was a big deal and everyone was really involved and and um I guess there was this uh, everyone was in the shadow of Gurmukh I guess let's just put it that way um, and there were some other younger teachers that were coming up that everyone thought, oh, well, she'll be the next one to hold the torch. And it was always like, no, nope, not going to have her holding the torch. You know, there was this quality that you could feel like people were had the energy like they were being kept down. Um, and so for whatever, you know, <laughs> I'm sure that could have been. A number of factors um, that were both, you know, personal and outside of them. Um, there were also people that came there that, you know, besides the oracle of the Dalai Lama, um, Kutin La, but like this man named Richard Holton came through and he would do these um, sort of spiritual guidance sessions. And he had been in the cult in and lived in the ashrams in Espanola and um, had like worked with Gurmukh and them when they were all young. Um, but he was never on the inside track. And he left, like, I think when there was that first flush of people like, oh my God, I heard that, you know, he might be sleeping with the secretaries. Like a, a bunch of people left in the middle of the night there was a flush of people in the eighties that left and he was in that group. Um, later we'll come back to him because like he comes into the story at varying points. And I ended up, you know, I was really broke. He was there. I was still in school. I was, you know, a broke grad student with a career like right after the economy like kind of tanked <laughs> it was a really bad time to sort of make this big move because there was everything was striking all the time the housing bubble had burst the economy was tough it was i was really broke like a lot of the time you know um anyway richard holton saw me and he let me like my the price i paid was um i baked him a pie <laughs> So one of the things I can do is bake a pie. Um, anyway, I saw him and he kind of helped me see like the, he helped me see a little more inside myself for my own spiritual guidance and source, like to look inside. And so I always kind of had that. Um, I feel like I was living some new version of myself. Like I was living another life when I moved here. Cause here I am in my mid late thirties and I'm starting this whole thing. Like I'm fresh out of college instead of fresh out of grad school. So there was this kind of naivete. I think that I was, that was inside of me um, around this period of time too. But also then one other thing happened and I was trying to date and like be a normal person. And I joined OkCupid and I had a couple of dates with this person. And then um, 
we like came back and we're like trying to do it and it didn't really work. And then suddenly in the middle of the night, it turned into this date rape thing. And um, I like shoved him off. Um, sorry if this is trigger warning for those. I'm talking about rape stuff. So trigger warnings. But um, I shoved him off and I said, I don't know you well enough for you to rape me in my sleep. Get the heck off me, basically. And I don't think he completed. But next scene, I'm pregnant and I have to have an abortion. So this is also me in my like, what is going on? Why is this happening to me now? Like, didn't this happen to me when I was in my 20s? <laughs> what year was this? That this, this is 2000. Uh, 10. Okay. So I just want to pause here and just go back. So you started in 2007 and you I'm, I'm assuming you, you take, let's see, you take classes and you're really just taking classes and, and volunteering at Golden Bridge and kind of becoming a part of things. Like you said, you got to take a chance to do this special event and this special event. Uh, um, what was his name? Steve? Robert Holden, what Richard was, Holton, Richard Holden, uh, just seeing different spiritual lenses into things. You're kind of in this new finding yourself phase, but you have this horrible rape incident that happens in 2007, but instead of really processing it, you're going towards kind of the Kundalini way, which is be victorious in our, in our victim places. Right. And so we're not really feeling our feelings and so we're not really, so I'm guessing you didn't tell anybody that you were working with or anybody in that. Community. Right. I barely you talked did. about it. You barely talked about it. And then this next incident, which is even a closer encounter, because it happens to be a day to semi-consent because it's a consent at first and then not, not necessarily the next thing. And, and just all the layers of which you're not feeling yourself, but at this point you're, fully involved in practicing regularly and your life's revolving around golden bridge and kundalini yoga but you're not yet quote taking teacher training yet you're just practicing dedicating yourself to going to moon classes and and this event and this event whether it's rebirthing so you think you're addressing these oh, past no. areas so that's why like you know the crisis of this next thing happened at 10 to ask yourself what's happened what's happening to me what's really going on I want to just kind of put a pin in the idea that a part of kind of getting deeper and deeper into the kundalini way is kind of this it's 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 the spirals deeper and deeper and where we think we're doing life altering work right. and healing but we're actually just creating cycles of re-traumatization and that you're kind of painting by giving us such a vulnerable lens into really two very hard uh, rape experiences. I want the listeners to hear the larger scope of what's taking place. She's getting further in to yeah. the community while these traumatic things are happening without real safety and yet a sense of kind of community and compassion and safety. You think you're you're processing it through the next class that's called detoxify your, your sexual karma. And then the next class that's, you know, <laughs> cleanse out the Akashic records and that hold the imprints of violation. And then you're like, yeah, that's the one, that's the one. And then you're back to that next class. This new moon is all about shedding blah, blah, blah of the sacral chakra. And you're like, yeah, that's it. That's it. Right. So it's the ethos itself is kind of creating an atmosphere of assumed safety in a way that you keep yeah. kind of going back to it. Yeah. And yet here you are in this traumatic experience. And I'm guessing you're asking yourself, why me? Why is this happening? I thought I processed this a year ago in my last rebirthing class, but here right. it is again. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Cause there it is like popping up in my Shavasana, you know, two years later and whatever. And then I'm asking Tej, like, she's going to know <laughs> why is that happening? Um, oh, I'm so sorry. So anyway, um, yeah, I, I got my, my first big step was that I got my spiritual name, um, in 2011. Um, and this is still at the behind the arc light um, golden bridge. And, but then that Valentine's day is when the studio moved to this other final location. Um, and 
that whole like shift was big experience just from the level of like working there and sort of the energy that it took because you know a front counter you think of you know it's like there's a wall and then there's a counter and so you only have people on the other side of you and in this new whatever they did which was like hyper level incorrect feng shui it was sort of like a 360 surround sound of experience and it was so tiring and um being in that space like was a whole new experience just working in that space suddenly was like dramatically energy draining and there was the kitchen like right behind us and people from all sides asking questions and not really knowing where to stand in line because they didn't design it very well so there was this and then they started imposing rules about like we have to wear a white shirt at one point in the old our uh, golden older old golden bridge we had to we weren't allowed to have sleeveless we had to have sleeves like there was sort of this thing going on where we needed to have our chasteness or whatever modesty mm -hmm. modesty dress um so I got my spiritual name that year and then I also did my first um white tantric and I was just curious I had been hearing about it you know this is one of the things I still hadn't done and uh a friend of mine uh that we all knew that had been there from like for forever, Oliver, um, who's sort of this kind of trans pixie man um, person, uh, and I were partners. And so that was my first thing that I did. And then I was interested in summer solstice, but I could never do it because I was the director of a summer program that was at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, which is like, I used to work there and they drug me back for a month to run this summer program that was like this pre-college summer session for high school kids to earn college credit trying to like get an experience of what coming to art school would be like and they lived in the dorms and we took them on field trips and they did all these courses and there was faculty and so i started teaching yoga classes to some of these students during that period of time um and but uh we moved to this new studio and at this time also Gurmukh is moving away from being in LA because she's living her life destiny of her name which is like spreading the knowledge across the land and you know going across the world ocean and all of this so she is not in LA a lot and I just found in my records that's like when we started even having to they Guru Shabbat was freaking out because finances is like a trigger for him and the parking lot cost extra money, the new rent cost extra money. Gurmukh wasn't in town. This is when Tej is starting now to become like the 9 a.m. is starting to build. It's not, Russell Brand isn't there yet, but he's getting there, <laughs> you know? And um, they got a group on. And so this was never something that would be a thinkable thing when I first joined Golden Bridge, you know, that Golden Bridge would need to have a group on to get people to come in the door. But this started changing the dynamic. And as those people started coming in and the classes started getting bigger and bigger and Tasia's to get, this is like Tasia's family now. And they don't know who Gurmukh is. They don't have all this history of like what came before because she's never even there. She'll show up for the teacher trainings and, you know, all of the like major workshops and a few of the, you know, annual events that are happening. But like her presence wasn't in the studio. She wasn't giving the weekly video email anymore. Like there wasn't that. It wasn't happening like that anymore. And so, you know, it was kind of happening that like the torch was being passed to Tej and it was sort of more like a circumstance. And as Jules spoke about, like then Hari Jiwan and Tej started also hosting a private um, teacher training in Santa Monica area and no one knew about it and then it started kind of competing and then they made them try to sign an anti-compete clause and things really started getting messed up so quickly you know a next year goes by and um 
let's see, I guess we're not quite there yet, but Tej, who I always felt like kind of never really liked me because I felt like she knew that I could see her because I kind of saw through her a little bit, you know? Um, she asked me to be a Savadar because she was hosting the cleanse. They did this five day cleanse like once a year and there'd all be these herbs about getting rid of parasites and, you know, sleeping well and flushing your, all the things. And we made juices and I rewrote this whole entire booklet. She chose me to be her Savadar and I was like, what? <laughs> she doesn't never really like me. Um, but, um, she does she has part of my story she gave me my first 40 day meditation you know she gave me my first mala she definitely is part of my story um and so i did the cleanse this is when russell brand is starting to come in russell was in the cleanse i had to work with his handler to make sure that he got all the juices because he was sort of like in and out of sobriety i think a little bit at that point um Richard Holton comes back. I have another friend, um, Sarah, who turns out used to live outside of Santa Fe and she and Richard were friends and she's a cinematographer that I worked with outside in the other world. And these two worlds kind of like found this weird connection with Richard Holton and we like discovered that we had this mutuality um, in him and um they together had helped someone escape the espanola ashram and drove them to portland and i don't really know who this person is like if, you knew this at that time or you're yes. telling us this now yes so i like somehow this is all starting to kind of like questions are happening like what and i didn't so like they're both talking to each other about helping someone escape the ashram and, and this had happened you know before that sira had moved to los angeles and become a cinematographer like we worked on jobs you know i got hired for a job and she was on the job and then we became very close friends so you didn't um, know her involvement in early 3ho at all no and i don't think she ever really was except for that she and richard were friends and then they helped she was also friend of this other person and they helped this other person escape and so I had kind of like heard about that a little, but I didn't really know the details. And, you know, then there was always these stories about like, oh, well, there was that lady Premka and she came back and, you know, all she did was blah, blah, blah. You know, like they, they would, they were, the, we've all heard like the ways that she was slandered over the years, you know, and you sort of yoga students like you. Her. you because mean. it's on the internet. Also, Hari Jiwan, like I accidentally confronted him in person I'm like do you know that there's this whole thing about you going to jail <laughs> and I thought it was like what I didn't I thought what it did was, he say I literally thought it was fake and he 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 was he did not no nothing he did not respond to me at all there was no interaction from him um that was a dead end whoopsie <laughs> But you're talking, this is all, you're saying these things early, like this is around 2011, 12, before yeah, you like your 12, teacher training. 13, you know? So you're just kind of hearing these things, you know, these things happen, but it just, right. it just kind of like, what do you feel happened in you? I'm like, just kind well, of like, I'm oh, not well, I had yeah. this thing, like, I'm not in a cult. <laughs> so that might've happened to people before, but that's not the way it is now. Well, and also, also, I feel like when Tej and Hari Jiwan split and sort of the way that, you know, this whole thing Jules brought up about like Tej being the archivist, you know, those were Guru Shabbat's files. Like that, she started doing that at Golden Bridge, like because they asked her to. Um, but then they clearly used it as a marketing scheme. I didn't really know the, how that all got played out. I was like, what? That's like not really true. <laughs> But they well, use I want to hear in Golden Bridge what was true. I want to hear what you know based on me, what was happening. Like, yeah. You know, because Guru Shabbat is in a lot of those white tantric videos. Like he's got all the old files. So he had asked her to start like cataloging them and archiving them and putting them in a thing. And like somehow there was another friend of mine that was another Savadar that he had helped Tej do that for a while. Like, and here by the time now, like 
he was one of Tasia's helpers. This is now the third or fourth person that has like been permanently kicked out of Tasia's life forever. Um, eventually that would include Russell Brand. But like now there's like this clear stream of people who she just suddenly, she'll literally, several people I know after Tej and Harajiwan left, like they would come back to Golden Bridge and be like, Tej kicked me out of her class. She told me never to come back, come back, you know? And she would just also randomly just kind of start yelling. And this did, you know, Jules described this to, that happened to herself. She kind of stayed for a little bit after, but I think that was a big red flag for her. And it was for many. So I knew this about, and I had this energy like that Tej and Hari Juwan were a cult, <laughs> but I wasn't in one. So I had, <laughs> you know, cause of the, you know, the way that it all kind of got discussed was like, there's team Gurmukh and Guru Shaman and team Tej and Hari Juwan. And they were a cult, but we weren't. <laughs> sure. And whatever. I also, I also want to just crazy. kind of, point that that how important this is that and this has really been coming to me in the last couple of days around one of I think the long-term coping mechanisms that a lot of people have used <laughs> has been to be able to identify some teachers as yeah they're a little like this and then and and we all have done it because we've all had the experience that says I like this person's teaching style I'm going to go to this person and this other person you could kind of list some of the things you didn't like what you said right. incessant right. talking domineering blah 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 you could name some things and other people kind of were a teacher that let you had it have an experience yeah. and, and and I'm pointing this out because it's one of the ways we've all found a ways to justify behavior we might have acknowledged that was uh, coercive, uh, abusive, shame-filled, and all the other things. And yet we just say, oh, that's just them. That's not the ethos or the totality of the whole thing. It's definitely not the teachings because I've had an experience and those teachings changed right. my life. It's right. just that type of teacher. Right. And this is one of the ways we compartmentalize and, and, and how cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. can allow us to, yeah. to do another two, three years, 10 years of commitment because we did have red flags that we just didn't link up yet, right? So, and yeah. on that note, through the, the victimhood, I don't want to identify with victimhood. That is such a key component that is used right. throughout all of the different styles of teaching as a way to lean towards our greatness, our light, yeah. of victory yeah. as opposed right. to really dealing with the emotions that come up with when there's violation and when there's shame and abuse especially when it's used through authoritarian uh, styles of teaching i want to um there the, i want to just remember that because like when we get a little further into the future there's like a harrowing conversation about some of this stuff that i had with Gurmukh. but i want to just jump back briefly like before Tej and harji when left there was this other incident with Oliver, the friend who I had first done the white tantric with. And, you know, again, we've got these movable walls in and they're the, you know, when you are in a hotel and there's a convention and they have those walls and they're kind of carpet and they fold them up. They had one of those types of things to separate this so they could have big events and then smaller classes. And the rooms were, you know, Amritsar and Pune and Rishikesh is upstairs or whatever. <laughs> and, um, sometimes this crank like would really be hard to do and to get this wall to like close and it had a door inside of it so you could go in between and it was anyway ollie broke ollie broke the wall and it caused this whole thing that um they started garnishing his wages and I, there was another Savadar um, working at that time who was a lawyer and I ended up starting this thing with another Savadar friend. Um, we talked to the lawyer and tried to figure out, like, basically I think they were illegally garnishing his wages. Um, 
there was also this complication of him not having legal citizen status from Germany. So there was some issues around it all. Like they kind of had him over a barrel and Ali has been like completely working full time the whole entire time. We all got paid minimum wage, you know, like $10 an hour, I think. Maybe that's a little above minimum wage. You know, take away the taxes. You're like barely paying the rent, you know. I was so broke the year that I worked full time there. Like a friend of mine fed me um, at that wow. period. But anyway, so all this is wages, before they moved. You're talking this about is the before okay. this is before Tejan Haraji one left. But the wall broke and Ali, so we were like having these, you know, trying to initiate some meetings with the um, executive director, who was a different woman. And um, allegedly, she's going to have some explosive memoir coming out at some point. I don't know what's going on with that. But um, anyway, uh, we were all concerned. A lot of the Savidars and the front counter managers were talking about this. We had crafted this letter to Gurmukh and Guru Shabad. We had crafted a letter to the, man the, the, the executive director. Like we were all like working on drafts and emailing back and forth to each other. And Ali was eventually, we're like, look, we are really concerned. And, you know, he basically was like, I'm so grateful to have the, you know, energy of support from you, but this is sort of my battle. And basically he left like at the end of the year and it was really sad, but maybe that was some kind of push outside of the nest. I don't know, however you want to put that around it. But like there was, we had concerns like, what if we break something and now we're all like, you know, liable. What if the key breaks for the jewelry counter and like, or the jewelry cabinet and like some jewelry got so, stolen? Are we going to get paid? You know, are we going to get our paid wages garnished? Like, what the hell? Like, we all felt really unsafe, I think is sort of the key picture there. And then Tayshan so, hired you and left. Okay. So, so um, I'm trying to track what's going on because you're obviously a staff at the ArcLight place. Yeah. Obviously, there's some reason that ArcLight has to move. You have to move. There's the tumultuousness of needing to move the other group factions off. You're kind of like they're a cult. We're not. There's kind of that energy. But you're still obviously dedicated. So even though you know these kind of internal workings are happening that are kind of not uh, putting staff in the best favor you're still dedicated when you move to this next place because you described the chaos of the next. So I'm just yeah. trying to track like where this yeah. is the tail of it all. Cause yeah. it's one thing to know, like to reflect back now. And I'm, I'm wondering how much of this was as these things were happening. They were, you're just kind of pointing them out because they were red flags along the way. Well, there were, there were a lot of sadnesses. And when I look back now, it's just like a stream of sadnesses. Like, you know, the, the studio closed, the Tej left, like the, the the other studio closed. I had a golden soul eventually. Well, like when you picture well, we it all. got us there. We're about 2011. So yeah, we're, we're like 2012 like... right now. Yeah, I'm yeah, jumping so... around. I, I apologize. Um, but I guess, you know, there, and then there would be, you know, these wonderful conversations that you'd have with the various teachers that are coming to teach their class, people that you get to know that are students, you know, there were still like really cool, wonderful people I worked with. We would get together in the early morning and play Michael Jackson and set up the studio to have every, you know, it was like, there was fun. Like there was some kind of like crazy trauma bonding amongst the staff, I would say. <laughs> But also, you know, then people, you know, teachers would come to me and be like, you know, working the front counter is like, you're just clearing so much karma here. And <laughs> so there was like this energy like, oh, well, I'm doing it because I'm going to do, I'm going to be better for this. Um, so there was that a little bit around it. Um, and did you... Did you work directly with Gurmukh? Were you taking her classes directly or she was always far away for you? No, she was around. She was, I, you know, I guess the big thing with me and Gurmukh is that like as Gurmukh, as her star started fading in Hollywood, um, you know, she was still like famous in Russia and India and all over Europe and 
you know, all around in New York, they had the Golden Bridge Studio too. So she was doing teacher trainings there. Yeah, and facilitating great. yatras through India, and they were there doing was, teacher yeah. trainings on an international basis. So, so much more there was on a that, but like nationwide. the Hollywood energy was starting to dim, and I was at this point like Ali is gone. A couple of the other old school staff, like I'm now the old school staff. And so there was, I think, some kind of uh, like a, she became closer for me towards me because I recognized like we started doing that thing, like what Jules is describing um, too. And like what people who ever served YB, you know, do like, oh, you're gonna come up with a plate of fruits and get their favorite latte and make sure it's there on the stage and like, like treat them, you know, like this holy person as so. And then I kind of knew how to do that because I sort of had, like there was sort of this like well she needs to we you almost feel a little sorry for her. <laughs> yeah it was it was a chaotic time and i became sort of this person that um kind of held the old energy and you know this energy of serving the teacher and that I could sort of fill those um I I knew how to serve that's the that's the big thing here you know and so that when Gurmuk was back in town you know I became the go-to person that she relied on to sort of bring her uh, all the things and to be making sure all of her needs were met. And, you know, it was a challenge because um, we were scrambling. Like I read through those old emails and there is so much like, love this, love this. I love you so much and da 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 da. And there's, when I imagine, sorry, I'm gonna, it was, <laughs> I don't really know how to go back into this. It was a, it was a really weird energy because everyone was starting to feel really kind of mourn, you know, the big break. Um, and I finally, this whole thing with my, um, directing the summer program, I, they, they shifted their schedule. So while I'm also kind of becoming closer to Gurmukh, I'm now like, I've been there the longest and I still haven't done my teacher training. Everyone else I've watched like come in, they've been there a year or two, they've done it, they've, you know, da, 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 they're, I'm there and I still haven't gone through this big rite of passage. Yeah, and including solstice or including like solstice. Solstice. and it was always deals. like films work all of these things kind of like never lined up and then at some point I like wrote this letter of intention to Gurmukh and then I was approved for this um you know scholarship to the teacher training and um and then before that all happened I was able to now attend my first summer solstice because that summer program changed its focus and their timeline so that I would be able to go. And from there, I would fly from Albuquerque to Minneapolis. And so it all became possible. They kind of, everything lined up. Right, the and, alignment. <laughs> oh my God, it's <laughs> so incredible. And I'm like the poorest that I've ever been. You know, and it's like kind of the biggest riff moment and kind of like the, old, like, like you said, kind of the nostalgia of before the riff happened and even yeah. the nostalgia of the old environment versus the new environment. I know right. that really kind of lingered with the golden bridge right. energy for a while. Yeah. So it was, um, you know, a big deal to go to the summer solstice. Um, and I had done white tantric a couple of times by then, but, um, I ended up having this partner who was somebody that I had recognized from 
uh, Golden Bridge. And then we did it again. And then we did it again. We like did white tantric three times in a row. And then it's like, oh my God, we're married, you know, like in, in the world that I'm living in. <laughs> is that what they said? Is that what? Well, was yeah, it's like, oh, Patrick, I, what, I, re what heard. I remember having a big cry, uh, like around that circle area, like where they do the, you know, the prayer flag thing, uh, the prayer day thing. Um, the night before the third white tantric and like, kind of just crying while I'm walking going like am I gonna do this like is this am I committing to this like this is gonna mean like all this stuff like what is happening is this but we were clearly having you know a powerful energy share like there was something bigger going on there um had there been a teaching that people had said that if you do tantric with each other that you're yeah like, it's like oh in. yeah i don't know if i don't know if everybody's familiar with that so share. oh totally and then later after you know later on i ended up like being in a relationship with that person because they ended up living like less than a mile from where i live in Hollywood and we had this whole affinity and even though they're a bit older than me and um he we we tried to make a go of it and he we're still friends it, but we're not together um I think it was like four or so years maybe five years I don't I feel like four years but um that later I had other tantric partners where I was like, no, we, well, we can't do it on the third day because then we're going to have to get married. You know, it's like, <laughs> I don't know if marriage is what is like, you know, but it's like, this is a thing. Like, it's a discussed thing, I guess, is sort of the bigger point and here. Is it taught in Dwight? Is it taught in the teacher training? I don't know. It's like you just talked about in the community. Yeah, like, it's know, talked what, about. So, what did you hear? And do you remember the earliest you heard it? Well, I. I this whole because thing I, I've together. heard it from different people. So I don't, I, it's just part of the lore, you know? Lore. <laughs> yeah. Good word. Good word. The lore, because I'm curious to hear as listeners uh, can comment that, you know, it'll be interesting to hear where this lore comes yeah. from and who else has heard it. I was like, am I ready for that? You know? And I had been kind of like in a lost place I, I wasn't really like super in love with the film industry. And I had some kind of traumatic experiences working on film and uh, just tough films, you know, especially independent films can be like a little bit punishing. <laughs> and I, I didn't really know, I'm like, is this my path? There's also this whole other part of me that had been questioning since the, like basically the second year I moved here is like, did the reason I moved to Los Angeles, is it really because I'm supposed to discover Kundalini Yoga instead of coming here to go to grad school and work in the film industry? Like, is this the real reason I'm here? You know, like I was still in this question and, and broke. Broke. <laughs> Um, questioning and broke there's a theme here ladies and gentlemen yeah <laughs> <laughs> and don't be a victim and broken and questioning oh my god <laughs> i'm victorious and so, you're victorious <laughs> so Just i'm like the fire you know I, mm -hmm. I do the um i do the solstice i fly to um you know like we do this thing and then the whole 40 days after the tantrics like i'm in minneapolis working this other job and there's all these like swirling question marks and it's like oh my god am i now like with this person you know I, this are our souls etherically connected for totally now? <laughs> have, we had, have we made etheric vows <laughs> <laughs> And so when I came back, it was the fall and, you know, then we have these meetings and it's like, oh my God, I guess we're meetings supposed to do this. Rich. And it was Maybe. sort of like, we had a meet. I think he came over or something. We just like kind of talked for a little while and then it was sort of like, I guess we're going to do this. So it was really sort of like that, like, and there was a big energy 
exchange like I don't know about our like physical compatibility and but like our energetic compatibility was clearly strong um so that was you know really kind of interesting to explore for a while like it's sort of what held it together you know um and then he had this whole you know he okay so he's 20 years sober um he got sober doing the yoga. He was one of Gurmukh's first Savadars. Like he, there was this whole other layer of connection that, you know, we had because now I'm doing that and I'm Gurmukh's Savadar and, you know, I'm her special person and he used to be her special person. And mm. so I sort of looped him back into the community and he's like always making mung beans and rice in his weird little way that he does. And I was so poor, I couldn't, I didn't, I couldn't afford food half the time. So then he's sort of making me, it turns out his apartment is like a block and a half away from where Golden Bridge ended up moving in Hollywood. And um, so I would like go there and eat mung beans and rice and hang out, you know, we were, this is hey, thing this going nice. on. How familiar um, does this sound? <laughs> the 80s or the 90s. <laughs> Or is it the 2000s? No. I know. <laughs> 13. <laughs> yeah. So I um I I kept doing the solstice still. Um and and while I was there, I, I of course I did save up. <laughs> I never paid full price for solstice either. <laughs> So um and one of the setup. things that I ended up doing there was working for this team called the tent setup team that um helps people who needed help to set up their tent we didn't like set up the camp we weren't like the setup crew we help people who came to the camp that needed help setting up their tents like single parents or elderly people or people that were just totally inept about whatever this camping experience was going to be and so we're like wandering the land with our hammers and stakes and helping people and um we would get these tips um people would pay money they'd pay twenty dollars like thank you so much you know we'd end up with a couple hundred bucks at least you know every summer and they would um the the, the i had three managers for the first three years um, I had two managers, one one year and then t uh, another really awesome guy the next two years. And then I became the manager for the following whatever many years that is, three or four years and um, of the tent setup team. So I've never done solstice where I'm not involved with the tent setup team. And uh, the whole solstice thing was, I was always really excited about the white tantrics. Um, I didn't, um, not all the times was I still with um, the person that I was with. They didn't come one year, uh, I think, cause it was just gonna feel weird, but I still went cause I was still managing. We co-managed the team for a couple of times. Um, and then this other uh, second gen person from Austin, Texas and I did it, who had been part of the team and he and I ran it for a while. Um, and the tent setup team was crazy because it was again like this heavy duty mega seva. Um, and in fact, one of the criticisms that I would have at the managers' meetings and then the follow up meetings is like, how are we supposed to, you know, here we are at the summer solstice sadhana celebration, and I'm like working until 11 p.m., like doing hard physical labor, basically helping people in the middle of the night, like who arrived late, and they, you know, were. <laughs> how am I supposed to get up for sadhana and still be like not only the you know capable of doing this level of work wandering all about in the sun you know with a hammer and a and, and stakes helping and helping and helping but then on so little sleep and not only that I also have to lead a team lead a meditation make sure everyone's uh, understands what their schedule is make sure that the karma yogis are knowing where they need to be and you know like i i couldn't do sadhana like i've only ever done sadhana a few times at solstice it's insane like the expectation of what that was was huge um 
and then that like last year that we had the solstice when there was that whole big dust cloud and everyone's like, ooh, YB's face was in the cloud and they're standing there in the tantric shelter and like the whole dining room tent like lifts up off the ground and there's elderly people and children trapped under there. I mean, that was a whole thing. And um, I'm jumping here a little bit just on this whole theme of solstice. Um, and, you know, we're just like, okay, we're right there. We're at the hospitality tent. We're watching this all happen. We're also, you know, capable of this kind of work. So we were completely like jumping in to help. And the people were taken away in ambulances. Like they had to drive all these ambulances eight miles up that dirt road and come and get these people off to the hospital. They're like bleeding and crying and we're trying to rope off the area. And then the very next day, you know, we were working and working and then we also had our regular stuff to do. Um, but the very next day, someone gave me a banana walking through the line. And I just like burst into tears because I had to like receive it from the person. Like I had to take, I had to receive. And then Gurma would invite us to go to her house in Taos because by this time they had closed Golden Bridge and moved. And um, there would be always like this summer gathering. And, you know, if you're special, you would get invited to go to her house. So we drive out and I drove a couple people. And one of the people that I drove out there was this woman who had like worked on some Native American land for a summer and she had braided these sweet grass braids and they're so beautiful I still have it and she gave me one as like a thank you gift for like, giving her a way to get to this thing at Grimmook's house and I like had to stop the car and pull over and like burst into tears <laughs> because of this energy of receiving that was so profoundly different than like the humongous energy of giving that has like sort of overwhelmed the experience by that time, like after this tent blew over. And that is sort of just like the hugest example of what it was generally like, you know, <laughs> it was meaning just sort of like, during your experience is what it was like, meaning you were very aware that you were an over giver during the stage. You were very aware that you were like, giving yourself away and didn't have anything left for you to get to sadhana like during this time of you being so dedicated were you that aware or are you just reflecting on that now I mean I was I was that aware like I pulled over and I said I'm not in a place to be in a place of I'm not able to be in a place of receiving without giving myself a little space <laughs> so forgive um, me I and need to take this moment. <laughs> can I ask on like, kind of like, a, you know, one who gets into Kundalini yoga and, and the atmosphere you've shared with us about what Golden Bridge was like, it's a spiritual seeker, right? So it's, it's, it's looking to kind of like find a way to navigate this, you know, busy and chaotic world with a sense of fullness and self and consciousness. And it kind of feeds the spiritual seeker in you, in yeah. me, in any of us. And so were you in a cycle where you realized, oh, I'm, I'm working on my receiving? Because like, I remember being in that. I remember practicing Kundalini. Oh my God. And some classes would cater to that. It would kind of be like, renew in you or learn well, to receive. And, yeah. like, and, and I'm saying this specifically because a lot of these themes are a part of every one of ours human development. And so it's a part of kind of like what makes spirituality predatory right. is... Totally. They prey on these aspects of us that are quite universal, whether it's a mother wound or a father wound or a whatever. Right. And I'm wondering, yeah. I'm guessing at this time you were aware of your kind of, I'm working on my receiving. Oh, yeah. You pause like, over and be like, I don't receive well, I give. And, and yet you're not yet saying, why am I dedicating all this energy right. for free to this organization <laughs> that's supposed God, to be Oh, my it? God. I know. Right. I'm, I'm, it's like, I am doing that. And yet I'm also still doing it because there's some kind of weird bonding that happens with all the people that you do it in, with in the community. Well, but, and that's really important. The camaraderie 
ministry and also how the community itself uses this language as a part of our spiritual right. salvation. That right. community, being in community is feeding us. Right. You don't get a stop to actually be like, is it? Right. How do I feel? You know? right. <laughs> because you're so busy doing the next event. What came to mind? What came to mind when you first brought that out is um, the Rama Dasa healing circle thing. Um, you know, it's like Great always example. part of the big classes. And then you have that circle. And this is one of Gurmukh's favorite things is to get everyone in a circle. And, um, you know, I used to be like, should I go in the middle? Should I go in the middle? And then by the end of the last several years, I was always in the middle of the whole entire time, <laughs> but I didn't actually know, like, am I being healed? I would sort of lay there and kind of be like, okay, I just, I'm going to receive this, whatever this is. Um, but it was like, I was sort of going through the motions of receiving because how can you really like, what is that exactly? I'm, I don't really know what, what that is, but I would, the Ramadasa healing circle, is well, I, and I just want to pause on that so you know what you just described was how she would do big circles where you know everyone's sitting in the circle and you know how you know we do the palms up kind of Ramadasa right. and you know anybody from the early days knows this one too but what Gurmuk did was have have students come into the circle so if you feel like you need healing right and you could come into the circle so that everybody's around you and so, you know, these are such beautiful ways that kind of create the illusion of inclusivity and also the illusion of like, wow, we get to create healing spaces yeah, that allow the illusion us. of healing. And, and, and why pointing this is because like, as you share really vulnerable experiences of your own confusion, you really represent someone who didn't necessarily jump in a year later, do teacher training, a year later, do this, but you did in a different way, right? Through right. A, a, a becoming a tr trustworthy agent right. um, because you were intelligent. You had something else you were dedicated to. And so in that, you got to create bonds and relationships with people that span back to old times, which kind of creates this web of like, well, I have the inside scoop different right. than this person, which is how you could eventually get to the conclusion that says, oh, that faction is a cult because Hari Jiwan, <laughs> their actions were way more culty. And yeah. so it's easier to do that, to be like, yeah, they're one of those. And I warned students like this. I would be like, I wouldn't really recommend those teacher trainings. And these are the reasons why, right. but I would recommend these teacher trainings. And these are the reasons why. Sure. <laughs> and it's important that we all see how we, be, like, I became the person who would want to be the Savadar for someone, but not just anyone. The only person I had that relationship with would have been Krishnakar, you know, but that level of kind of naive, nostalgic devotion right. showed up similar so, to how you had that historical view into the way Golden Bridge was, who Gurmukh has always, quote, been. Now you're that kind of tether that says, I can trust you. And there is a specialness to that, like not just specialness, like I feel special, but also a specialness of, I have a lens that a lot of people don't have right. into a bigger picture of it all. And, and I think your story somewhat represents that, that your teacher training came later. So you had levels of dedication, but based on kind of stages in your own life, that were confusing. Like, what am right. I doing in LA? Am I here to get on the right. teacher training path or am I here to become a film person? You know, you're asking these questions. And I think spiritual communities like Kundalini Yoga do well at um, preying on that, right? Preying on right. that questioning. And I think that it's, you know, maybe a personality type thing, you know, this isn't unlike what working in uh, you know, a horrible circumstance around a, a film set is, you know, where you end up like the whole art, I was, you know, in the art department and or running art departments and you end up with those same kinds of like, we've been through the fire together, you know, we're, and so it almost ends up being kind of trauma bonds that you sure. form with your crew, there's people that you're always gonna, you know, rely on to be there with you. Well, I, this one sounds like it could be rough. I need you there with me, you know? It's like that same energy. <laughs> yes. 
would be the same kind of sort of framework that held this all, all of us together in at, at the Golden Bridge. I just I can't even agree more around the the trauma bonding around like yeah I had to you know stay up all night and set up the tents and right. get a chance but I you know I did ten minutes of breath of fire and then I drank some cayenne and lemon juice and I'm good to go I'm ready to do my meditations and it's kind of the energy around yeah. the over enthusiastic energy of sleep deprivation. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Cause again, the same thing at summer solstice, like all these little bubbles that I operated in, like we're kind of in the same sort of like chaotic sort of creative, spiritual higher realms, you know, around the yoga and, and you know, on the backdrop of, of these legacy teachers telling their stories of sleepless times of no sleep of, of their meditations and what YB had them do and so when you're hearing anecdotal stories of like the olden days and then and and also that this level of sacrifice is for humanity right it's for yeah. it's it's for clearing karma it's, it's cleaning akashic record these types of things only add to that level of um, devotional yeah. aspiration right um yeah. So, I mean, basically Golden Bridge, I right at the end of Golden Bridge. So my teacher training happened at the Hollywood Golden Bridge right after Tej and Haraji one left. So everyone besides Gurmukh and Guru Shabed that were part of that were kind of new people that were coming through the studio, um, which was also this kind of weird thing, considering that I had a lot of experiences with these other two teachers, even though I had some walls. Um, but I guess that's a little bit remarkable. Um, and um, and then immediately that's Gurmukh and Guru Shabad moved to Taos and decided they're gonna close that studio and they had their Santa Monica studio. So um, I did some teacher trainings, a couple of teacher trainings at the Santa Monica studio assisting there and then some of those same teachers that were part of my teacher training were part of the Santa Monica teacher training. Um, and I was, uh, I, I sort of was the second in command of the assistants. Um, another friend of mine that I'm still close with um, was kind of in charge of all of the homework and the admin and getting the crew. And then I was kind of in charge of all the scheduling. Um, and I mean, I remember being in Santa Monica and like, just, I was so fully enmeshed by this point. Like I remember like making sure this student had their socks off, you know, because the energy flow is going to be, you know, really blocked by those socks and like, wow, like let them have their cold feet. <laughs> you know, it's like some of the things I look back, I'm like, oh, I can't believe I did it, you know? And, um, but that sort of, and this is around the time I remember having a conversation. This is what I wanted to come back to about like trauma experiences with Gurmukh. And she was recounting some old story of like hitchhiking and she had gotten raped and all of this. And it was, it was this thing where we were sort of, oh yeah, that happened to me too, but it was no big deal. Like we kind of both had this like, hyper energy of minimization like self-bypassing you know ultimately it's just a lesson that needed to be learned I have a part to play in everything you know and because this whole like aspect of um what was my part in this like how did I help to cause this to happen was like a huge thing you know and this is I'm learning now a huge thing that happens um with people in trauma is that they try to take power over the situation by claiming some ownership of it. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally, I did that to myself, um, you know, in- But you're also, this experience also happened within an ethos where that was the overall operating system. Oh yeah, and I, it was like, we were both like, we're victorious. And I look, that's one of the conversations that I look back on now that is sort of the most frightening that I had um, in my whole time because the way that it, 
the bypassing energy of it is really strong. But I want to point out how empowering it must have felt to be having this conversation with a powerful teacher like Grand right. Mook to have her share a rape experience. You have this that you've been going through for a long time, probably haven't shared with many. And suddenly you get to teach it, not, not to share with anyone, but her. And, and she's powerful and domineering and graceful and radiant and all of these combobulated personas. And how special that is. Like, I don't right. know if that, I'm guessing it felt special. Maybe I'm sure. Kidding. Yeah, totally. I mean, it, it, you know, it's like, oh, I feel seen, you know, <laughs> all so of the reflection of you're saying that's bypassing. And, and so I want us to feel the difference because in the midst of that, it must have just felt so alignment like, like right. wow, my teacher, it's like it, it probably induced more dedication for you which is actually a form of more bypassing folks, right. you know, it's like, right. wow. And so for us to see that synonymous nature of the further and deeper you're committing into Kundalini Yoga, you're actually right. affirming bypass and a level of um, self gaslighting that happens where we're denying self right. and, and again, over giving, and there's such an imbalance, but it's rationalized because it's balancing out an etheric karmic energetic thing Therefore, being yeah. broke is okay because blah, blah, you know, keep going. Yeah, no, totally. It's, um, it, that's been a huge part of me now in my therapy journey post 2020. Yeah. Um, I also want to, just on the topic of bypassing, uh, I, like, this is right before the pandemic is also when, um, a call security was getting, I just want to like, put a little light on that. Like a call security was getting some heat because of the border control situation with ICE and had major contracts with ICE. They were basically- And there were a ICE lot contracts. of community talks about that. Um, and people were discussing that a lot. That was also like people were boy boycotting solstice because of that at that time. Um, and let it be known that it's because of yoga students. It's because of activists and yoga right. students that kind of made these links that started doing these level of boycotts. Nobody right. within the community made that be known. So um, I guess like this is just a little weird bomb to drop. But at this point, like for the last, the, that I think that was taking place in 2019. But like since 2014, 2015, I had been chosen to be the person who um, gave Gurmukh's 40 day meditations. And th this was a seva that people didn't really know. Like I um, found out that I was part of a chain that included Tej and a couple other teachers, um, but that like at a certain point in her fame in the nineties and two thousands, Gurmukh stopped individually personally giving the meditations when students would request and so there was um a seva that i was doing on the side of all of this which is um to to write as gurmukh and give people like a meditation and a nice story to reply to their email and they were getting forwarded to me by um her assistant and so also at that time, um, I was, because I was sort of secret Gurmukh, um, I, I, her assistant was also sending me like, here's what Gurmukh is reading right now. Here's what, um, you know, Gurmukh is saying about this and that. Here's what Gurmukh is doing for this. You should be appearing for Gurudev Singh's blah, 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 you know. Um, and so I got the, you know, here's what Gurmukh is saying about the Akal security situation. Like, here's her statement when students are confronting her and asking her. And it's basically just a bypass, you know, like, I trust that whatever the Serious Sing Sound Corps is saying is what the thing is. And it's a quote, like I have it like a, um, you so know. You're saying you were doing this in 2020 when all this came out and her responses. Yeah, so in like I was privy to all of her ways of handling all of these things. Um, and then in 2020, um, 
basically, you know, the pandemic hit, I read the book. Um, then I started reading all of the Facebook accounts. Um, then I, you know, uh, Dadam sent me his mom's book. Um, and so like, I, at that point, like, was really in a deep place of questioning. And one of the things that I needed to do was extricate myself from the seva because now, you know, it had been five years that I've been doing that and the emails in the emails. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's really get perspective on this, you know, as, 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 as Gurmuk had gone from being the, the celebrity, uh, star of Hollywood teaching stars. She, you know, she had a home studio, then it went to the golden bridge and there's kind of many levels to this, but she became known for being the pregnancy yoga calls mm -hmm. away pregnancy and, you know, really kind of grew up. And then during these stages that Beth has explained on this episode, her fame is getting so big, she's traveling more than she was located at one particular studio. And so the online space in terms of of like when when somebody was your student you know a lot of students and you know want a personal meditation given from their teacher and if you take yeah. kundalini yoga teacher training everything about having your teacher is sold as a part of like the destiny path and and so what i hear you say beth is essentially for five years you were the email responder of the voice of gurmuk and when people would want Correct. a a meditation that was individually given from their teacher, it would be coming from Beth Van Dam. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow. I know. I mean, um, I guess, you know, the whole thing around that is that like, there was this kind of quality where she was being treated more like, um, you know, a saintly person as time went on. And then like this sort of fit into that model for me, you know, that like, th that she doesn't have time to serve all the needs of everyone. And that like, this was the, I, you know, I gotta say like, I was really intimidated at first. It was really hard. I was like, oh my God, I have to be Gurmuk. Um, and, and I would sort of psych myself up for it and put myself into, you know, meditative space and try to, you know, she would like appear in my dreams sometimes, you know, I was really like, and her assistant kept sort of reinforcing this energetic link that was between us also. And, you know, I was, this is part of why I was also, you know, in her little inner circle and the visiting her in Taos and going to all her of home that. when they moved to Taos. Um, they have yeah. Special invitation. Right. Um, and I was there. I helped them when they finally, her daughter, Wa, after Golden Bridge Hollywood closed, her daughter, Wa, kind of took over the. Santa Monica studio for a couple of years but then when that closed like I helped pack it up and you know I was there for all the major things um and so um I was sort of like the last man standing <laughs> in a lot of ways um with her and then this was sort of this big I guess as time went on I became more comfortable in that role um and I, I think I got something out of it a little bit too. Um, I don't really know what, <laughs> but yeah. at the time it felt like I was doing something good. At the time it was like, I was serving in some important way. Um, uh, yeah, I wanna put a pin here and just say that you or anyone listening, we don't have to know or spend time on like what was in it for us. There's gonna come a stage in our own healing process where we get that. That's a, I, I think, and I've learned that that's just a part of the recovery process. Sure. To own that there was a, you know, there's, there's always two sides to an enmeshment, but I want to pin how the ethos of the community itself created that picture for you to wear as a badge of honor. 
yeah. to be dedicated, to be selfless, to be the last man standing, you know, the warrior, like there's so much that has gone into you becoming that way. You didn't just end up there seven years later and be like the most fierce and dedicated Savadar ever, you know? Right. Um, and yet it's so easy in our healing process to kind of own too much of the responsibility of it because we quote, don't want to be a victim. We want to own our part. <laughs> right. Going back yeah. to that victorious, it's a really yeah. big thing. This vict victim versus even now today, you know, it's so easy to push away this this idea of victim instead of fully feeling our pain, instead, yeah. instead of fully feeling the atrocities that have taken place, the extraction that has yeah. taken place. Um, so I just want to honor you for that. And and here you are fully dedicated. It's 2020. You've read Waz's book, Premka, yeah. you've read all the books, and suddenly you have to extricate yourself from this responsibility. But also Grimook hasn't put her statement out yet. She was she kind of put no. her statement out quite late, no? Right, right. And um I guess also I just want to um mention that like after Golden Bridge Hollywood closed, I started teaching at a studio nearby in Los Feliz, um, Golden Soul where I taught for five years, I never wanted to drive all the way out to Santa Monica to basically earn grocery money and spend the gas getting there. But um, I did do the teacher trainings because what an honor. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then at Golden Soul, I was teaching. And then eventually when Golden Bridge Santa Monica closed, I did also um, assist a teacher training at Golden Soul again um and that one was with um uh Durham dave and city markup was sort of the lead teacher trainers there well and um, that must have felt really wonderful i i, I want to speak to how um wonderful is like is a wrong word i'd love for you to hear speak to it but like when these guest teachers come in or there's a special next new training especially when the training is then like I noticed a couple of years are therapy, you know, Kundalini yoga and therapy or this and that. So like when you're tying in something that obviously is deeply resonant for you because of the, your own violations and harm right. and, and it ties in some other love called Kundalini yoga here, you are, you know, right. it's kind of feeling like a resonance right? and it pulls you in even more. And there's yes. something special about these guest teachers, whether it's Siri Marga or whoever it comes in, they've written a book and then they got their own 1970s story of why what makes them special to YB. Right, right. So just to clarify, Guru Dharam from Sweden, or he's English, but he lives in Sweden and New York, is a different teacher that does the yoga therapy trainings and Siddhi Marka and Dharam Dave are from LA. And they had actually been part of the teacher trainings at Golden Bridge that I was part of and the other ones that I assisted. Um, Got it. Yeah, so the yoga therapy training with Guru Dharam, who's kind of like this shaman who mixes up types of modalities. And um, he's also an acupuncturist and a Chinese traditional Chinese medicine teacher and uh, acupuncturist. Uh, uh, healer, I guess, um, and dream work. I always kind of liked this esoteric quality that he wasn't just a pure Kundalini yoga person. Um, so I was always kind of attracted to that about him. Um, but anyway, so there was that. And I, I did that. Um, I, I hosted a modality for that at the Lunger Hall of the Guru Ram Das Ashram. And that's where I first, like, I didn't even really go to the, um, the Gurdwara, you know, it wasn't part of my thing. Like Siri saw his wife taught me how to go and like bow at the guru because we were right next door. Like I didn't have that whole aspect really. I mean, I appreciated the music and I, I experienced it and ex did that part of the culture at summer solstice a bit, but the, I didn't have, I was always kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> this is, I, I felt like, it was, a. Uh, I love the mantras, you know, in my own way, I prayed to the guru. I had like what I would call religious experiences, chanting some of the things at white tantric, um, you know, of course, like I had done by that time, so many white tantrics 
that you start to kind of get like involved with, ah, this is the playbook again, you know, like the second day you're, um, you know, the beginning of the story at summer solstice, the three day journey, and then the single day journey, like they're all sort of the same thing, only either it's compact into one day or it's made out into three days. And like they always end around or culminate, like build up to chanting HUD. And you, by then, you know, like you're basically, HUD is just, it's a game, like it, it, the, I, <laughs> something's gonna happen when you're chanting hut like the, the, there's like it's I, I I guess I started to realize even though I loved it still like I I started to realize like how much each type of thing was building towards this energy that was always predictably gonna do this thing just like you know opening well, chakras and all of that and whatever, but. I guess I wanna pause and just say, it's interesting how we can know, we can be so critically thinking that we know what's going on and yeah. yet it still A, impacts us and almost maybe causes a craving for more. Right, right, exactly. And when Once I again, I, I somewhat think it's like a bit of a coping mechanism of how we notice and then we go right back to something else. And and it's fascinating to hear because that quality shows up in so many different people's stories. Yeah. Yeah, no. And honestly, to be like really plain, like I felt like white tantric is this aspect of this whole thing that has been the most transformative for me that even when 2020 hit even when I learned like all the atrocities that happened to the children because honestly like the book is just like the very outer layer of the onion like once you started digging in like there is so much more pain and hurt and people that were caused it's really, that was learning all of that stuff, you know? And I was still like, but white tantric, I guess I would probably do it again. Like it still kind of held me in because I, there was something about wanting, not wanting to sort of invalidate those things that I was holding so high, you know? I what wanted I those experiences to mean something. Um, like I wasn't ready to take that away from myself, <laughs> I guess. Mm. Um, because to me, that was the real big deal was white tantric. Like I was really into that. That's sort of the reason why I got involved with that person I got involved with at white tantric. You know, it's like, that was the energy. Like all of that was kept me going. Mm. Um, anyway, and I, I I feel like ultimately I, I agree with Jules. The white tantric energy is us. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that any of these aspects are us, you know, and yeah. um, I, I'm, I'm more fascinated that of how you felt about it in 2020, because as we dissect it and we start realizing that we are the X factor in any of our transformation, right? It doesn't matter whether we were saying HUD or whether we were saying I am or whether we were saying whatever that, I think that's what we're learning about cults is doesn't really matter the indoctrination. There's a formula that, that yeah. creates a level of coercion and it doesn't discount transformative experiences, but those transformative experiences belong to us. It's not the actual thing. But right. that takes time for us to process and metabolize. So it's 2020, you find yourself in these binds, you are reading and, and waking up your eyes, but you're still hooked on white tantric because your tra major right. transformations have occurred in the juxtaposition of white tantric yoga and all the other right. kudus. Yeah. So what do you do? So I wrote a letter to Gramuk um, and said that I needed to be free of attachments um, to that I was honoring the voices of women. And that I believe that the time is now that, you know, this is actually what the Aquarian age is. Hello. Um, that we are starting to break apart some of the old paradigms and that I needed to be free from um, any kind of 
commitments that were around this community so that I could really analyze what it was for me and me alone. And so she wrote me back and it was a really polite and graceful letter um, saying, thank you so much. And you're welcome anytime. And they put a pause on it on the website. Like, I don't even know if, you know, they're, they're not allowing people to, from the random world that don't know her email to, to ask for meditations anymore. So there was that. And then I, I still was kind of like reaching to Prit Paul and Anand um, about summer solstice and like the injustices around um, kind of the white supremacy aspects of things. Cause it was really more like the children's stories and the racism stories that got me to like, be like, this is fucked up um more than anything um and so I was sort of like what are y'all doing about this and then there was a zoom call for the solstice managers I don't think that really went anywhere like apparently it was going to have a follow-up and then there never was one and then they 3HO changed their website into this like hippy dippy looking new graphic design and I was also getting um on a list in my regular health insurance because of the pandemic, the need was so strong for therapy, I wasn't able to just automatically get um, a therapist. So eventually my name came up out uh, on a thing and I started working with a therapist and it literally took me over a year to finally connect that um, I had this trauma that was completely unresolved. <laughs> wow. And later I, had heard from another therapist friend who said yeah you know um working and she's also a kundalini yoga teacher actually but she said working with this community is some of the hardest because everyone thinks that they already have it figured out everyone thinks that they're victorious you know we all kind of believe that we don't need that type of thing because we're already working out all these things on our own anyway and here i am like talking about you know being in a bathroom slammed against this sink and like all the tears are flowing all the emotions are still there and i've just done all this yoga and all this tantric to supposedly clear it out and it's like waiting for me you know 12 13 years later just waiting for me to finally fucking deal with it <laughs> so anyway um that is really what made me shift and i had always kind of been like I'm on the fence about what to do with Kundalini yoga. And after that, I was like, okay, <laughs> I have a clear place that I start to understand who I am, like in a new way now, like I started to feel more like myself. And what I did at the recommendation of a friend is she's like, if you make yourself a victim and to try to work this through, you don't have to be a victim for the rest of your life. You just do it until you like heal from it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's okay to feel the victimhood of being assaulted. Wow. Is it going to be that right. easy? <laughs> exactly. It's actually okay to feel, right? And exactly. Even all this time, I've still been like refusing to give myself that space. Wow. So um, hmm. anyway, I did that. I did that for about six months. And when, when, when did that begin? When did you do the, the start the therapy? Because that was pre-2020, right? It was like mid 2020 that I started. Got it. So all this came open. You were able to get therapists. And so in the last year from 2020, 2021, when you were still a bit in limbo around like white tantric has helped me so much and you got to start seeing this therapist. So it's got to be able to start penetrating, take about right. a year, but then you could actually like revisit that initial trauma experience from 2009 right. and start breaking this apart. Yep. And then this friend gives you this advice of it's okay to give you, it's okay to have a space the window as long as it needs to have give yourself the victimhood window. Good. <laughs> Beautiful. So yeah, I feel like, you know, at some point, I think my friends, I just tried to just start talking about that that had happened to me, you know, because I never really talked about it. Yeah. Um, I think possibly I said it to some people too many times, but I was just like needing to vocalize it to be like getting it out and to talk yeah. about that that had happened and talking about how depressed I was after that abortion, which I never wanted that baby. Yes. <laughs> but that's not why I was sad. I was sad because I rode my bike and I started bleeding. You know, it's like, I just, 
didn't well, want that to happen to me. It's the trapped emotions that never got felt. So not only are we feeling what we're feeling now, but we're feeling things that got frozen over that never got felt. Right. So yeah, um, I did a lot of talking about it and uh, starting to kind of like crush through all these conversations, that, like that conversation with Gurmukh about how like, oh, wow, we made it out on the other side of rape trauma, no problem, no big deal. Like, what does all that mean to how I was to myself? And who was that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You mean the self neglect, the yeah. awareness, the awareness of not just the bypass, but it's like that. Like, where did I learn this ultimate? Like, the community reinforced a much deeper self neglect, right. lack of self attention within an ethos that's calling it that we get to attach ourselves to called awareness. You know, I'm holding the badge of the most conscious of all the types of yogas, and yet, meanwhile, I haven't been able to feel. That's right here. Anyway, so yeah, that's the basic gist of the story of what happened to me. Well, in in this unfolding that you've brought forth, the the thing that's ringing so loud is that from 2007 to 2020, that amount of time, um, we're talking about like a 15 year span of time, yeah, and very early on some traumatic experiences that even within a community and culture that you know touts itself as helping trauma like you really brought up some great points of what happened after 2020 of you know the whitewashing of 3ho website it went from having you know traditional logo to like some sunshine and some black people on there and stuff oh and god it's just I the know. most fascinating like i'm like what just happened and in the name of trying to do better, but it's not. You got to do better with your do better. Right. Um, I do so, have to yeah. say thanks for funding me and my therapy because after my little six month window of therapy ended, because you only get like so much through my insurance because they're trying to keep the need, I did get the three HO money, you which need is the five dollars. But you know, yeah. it feels like it's going to run out soon. So, and I just want to again highlight that you're talking about a process that began for you in 2020 the first therapy you started having was 2020 after Primka's book after hearing uh reading Wa's book after um just seeing the racisms hearing you know you and Jules had kind of both said but it was the children's stories and you know this is so fascinating to me because um the horrible sadistic level of sexual assault that YB did on so many of the women that were in his inner pocket, um, to me was some of the most horrifying thing that was revealed, you know, not of course that, you know, all the children were abused, but I find it so fascinating that the ethos of kind of this new yoga student that might've started anywhere from say 1996 to your time, maybe 2020 all the way through, it's the surprisingness of the abuse to the children. Yeah. And is that, do you think, because you kind yeah. of had a fantasy around what was happening with those children because of this amazing community? Or did you just never, do you have? I never heard about any of that. I mean, I had heard that the situation was rough in, you know, the early days of Mitty Pity, but like, um, I had never heard about that. And you know, now that you're saying it and in the context of this conversation, like I wonder if a part of that is, you know, a lot of those women still kind of bypass their own experience Trauma. around it in terms of their agency. And I For think sure. it is really hard to um to to look at and hmm. and and it to need to have some kind of like I was a part of that. I chose that. Like, I understand. I understand that that need exists because I had that. I have had that need, you know, to like say that this, I played a part in this horrible experiences that happened to me. Like, so I almost wonder, is this 
part of, you know, my training around bypassing for myself, like where it's like, well, they're not really fully taking, you know, um, how do I phrase this? Like there, there's still some energy. It feels like there's still some energy from a lot of those women that, that needs to hold on to their agency which I, again, I understand. Holy. But then yeah. when you think about children, they don't have agency. So in the way that I sort of bypassed my own self, I maybe I'm also bypassing some of what their experiences were. And I'm sorry to all those women for that. I, I just actually want to acknowledge it, that being a victim of sexual assault yourself and then to be able to really examine to what extent they other women have gone through abuse and we haven't heard from those voices in the same level of vulnerability that we heard from second gen on a live zoom call right like we've heard a couple and so we haven't had that level of direct intimacy and we've had a few um but only those that witnessed that could really start to right um fully do that so i, I can really appreciate everything you just said so thank you for that um and also probably the surprise nature. I know I was really moved by the second gen calls as well. So I'm not trying to discount that, but rather I keep hearing kind of like a surprise to people, but it was the second gen I had no idea about. And it's, right. it's um, it, this silence nature of, of that history, right. I guess makes so much sense that, that, that many people kind of felt like that really bursted their bubble the most because of how vulnerable those calls were. Also, I just got to say, like, I still feel like there's an energy that is being carried forward of alienation around the second gen um, that I find really challenging. I'm not a second gen. Like, I know many second gen. I know many second gen. And I feel like the rift between the first and the second gen is bigger than could be, than it could be. And um, I hope that the, I hope that that alienation leads somewhere positive because I don't, I, it feels sad to me right now. You mean how alienated second gen feel to you? I feel like there's been ever more sort of compartmentalization of the second gen from since, a distance, just watching. Since um, 2020, like since all this happened. Well, and you know, by no means do I want to say I represent anything having to do with the second gen. If anything, I want to speak out loud that we're a multifaceted group of people that have um, very different experiences, yeah. as well as some similarities to our experiences. And that adds to the complexity of that level of um, uh, yeah. uh, separation, right? Because even amongst any of us that are considered second gen, anybody born into this Dharma, there's not a level of camaraderie amongst a lot of us, right? Because we we don't have those, um, not everybody sees everything the same, right? right. Everybody's, right. every generation is a very different generation. There's lots of different types of outlooks. And so it's, um, there's no one type and it can add to it. But also I want to add that that's a part of, I think, what 3HO has created as an overall ethos of separating people according to the decades, right? So yeah. there's lots of separations that are used in the language of hierarchy within 3HO. But one of them is, are you a legacy? So it went from first generation to being legacy teacher. And right. even within the whole teacher training ethos, they would nostalgia the legacy teachers they would pedestalize them and you're a testament to that right so there was this pedestalization of that level of teacher and then there's also a fetishization of those born in right so right. the second gen that came and taught were also fetishized in a way and bolstered um and also there was that within that group there's an in and out clicky Right. So uh -huh. were you born a second gen, then you had a certain level of entitlement to access to things that somebody who was a dedicated person like a Beth or a Jimena or whoever right. didn't get right. that level of preferential treatment. So right. that is a part of what you're speaking to, too. Totally. Yeah. I mean, honestly, 
a huge part of my own healing has really been listening to the stories of everyone on your podcast. So I do want to thank you for doing this because I'll tell you what, I never saw myself sitting here (laughs) talking to you at some point, like I was sort of just this outsider looking in and um, anyway, uh, it has really been healing for me to hear the stories of others in in a big personal way. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And I do feel that listening um, is such a revolutionary part of our healing process because it helps us um, collect the fragmented parts of ourselves that got buried and sliced right. off along the way and that both can be true. And, yep. um, and also that... I didn't know your story before you came here to the extent of, um, of course I knew parts, but like to really feel into from 2007 all the way to 2020 and that your dedication just kind of got more and more entrenched and dedicated. And then 2020 for all that to come apart um, and for you to start seeing more clearly and then to immediately be able to go into therapy for your own well being, that you're part of like reclaiming hidden violation in your own body has been a part of you being able to properly see what kundalini yoga meant for me or you know what what it was doing and why and that's such an individual process yeah you know and so listening can help and I'm so happy that these podcasts have but I want to just again highlight your vulnerability to share because to share very pivotal moments where something occurred to us and then we buried it that can happen in any environment you could be a a, a, in a religious organization you could have been a political or anything and then the bonds formed around that hidden violation occur right and then life happens but when that happens within a spiritual community that touts itself as healing trauma as rebirthing ourselves from karmic uh you know, harms in the past, whatever, you're reinforced simultaneously that you're doing the right thing in these aspects. And to me, that really right. highlights the, the avenue of what makes the teachings and carrying on this level of ethos harmful because your healing process is very raw and fresh right now. We're talking about a year in of therapy of you reclaiming two major incidents of rape and violation but within the landscape of a spiritual community that was supposedly helping you heal that. Right. And more helping you hear the history of all of that. And the ancestral healing. <laughs> and, and it's not just Beth that's susceptible to want to heal ancestral trauma. We all do. You know, I'm, I'm very much that same person that I'm, I'm pulled into those types of workshops too. And the entanglement of, having transformative experiences with our breath or with the meditation or with the chant or with community or, or through selfless service. These are wonderful things and can be abusive simultaneously. And that's really like what you've unfolded here. Um, It's scary because it is continuing and we have to really be willing to do our personal trauma so that we have the courage to speak to it so that somebody else doesn't end up in, in this 10 years from now and we're listening to their testimony. That's the problem that really I feel like right now is, you know, some of the quote unquote legacy teachers are still teaching this exactly the same way. And that is really damaging and not helpful for anyone who is seeking the healing that they're trying to sell. Um, I, I, some of the newer teachers, people that aren't quote unquote legacy, you know, they have a maybe a little bit more of a modern approach to all of it. And it might not hit those same beats that can sort of signal that messaging is so strongly and fine, whatever (laughs) you do you. But, um, this, the fact that this is still like being revered and being taught in the same exact way is truly problematic for me. Yeah, I 100% feel you there. Well, as we're wrapping up, what last? What last do you want listeners or a new student that's coming in to hear? Like, what more do you want to leave on this recording? 
I guess <laughs> my first thing is sort of snarky, which is like, consider yourself lucky if you never get kicked out of Tage's class. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess mainly that um, since I've been like really deeply outside of the Kundalini yoga community, I feel more holy myself than I ever have before while well, the whole time that I was in it. Yeah. And you give us a unique lens because you were entrenched in, in levels of, of teacher training, supporting teacher training, supporting legacy teachers, supporting uh, organizations that hold trainings, supporting the, the solstice site in its, in its operating and very fresh and recent. Um, so you have a lens into how that trading system is carrying on right now to this day. Yeah. Which blows my mind because I, you know, I, to watch it go on, it just kind of feels like it's a, it's a, it's a machine with its own legs. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's sort of like, I still follow some of the Instagram channels. It's like kind of watching Fox news to me. <laughs> where it's like what are they doing mm, I don't know I can't really look <laughs> anyway mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so in knowing all that's continuing um you know how do you feel about teachers that just take YB out of out of it but continue teaching the teachings accordingly yeah. I feel like I have a I have a couple I know a few folks who are like going on and teaching but they're just teaching yoga without the word K in front of it. You know, it's not Kundalini yoga. And the thing is, they're not certified to teach Hatha yoga. They're certified to teach Kundalini yoga. So you can't just take that word out and then, you know, use kind of a more generic -y type of a Kriya. And then, and then if I walked into that class, <laughs> That would be a major trauma situation that I would be stepping into. Um, I would march myself right out. Not everyone is gonna be in that situation. So to me, I have I have a big problem with just like taking the word off. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, the people that are trying to go forward and do it, like some of them already commit a whole life to that as a career, uh, what else are they gonna do? I don't really know where to go with that. Um, but thankfully I always had a, a, you know, teaching for me was always more of a seva than anything. It was, you know, maybe grocery money, but I was never aspirational in the way that it could be my full-time career ever. Mm -hmm. um, I never had any designs around that. So those that did, and you know, there's even been courses taught about like how to make a career in a spiritual teaching model. Like some of the teachers in LA have even done workshops about workshops on that. Career how do you make money being a career yoga teacher? Wow. Um, I to me that's really problematic. Um, but uh, you know. Also, I still really kind of, I, every now and then I'll like dip a toe and feel it out. I went to one live class recently in Hollywood and the yoga itself is kind of fun. I still like my body can do it just like no problem even. Um, but then the meditation, it doesn't feel safe. It feels like psychically unsafe, the meditation space. Also, are we really healing Ukraine, you know, by chanting this sort of weird unsingable sonatum thing, you know, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> you mean for long distance healing? <laughs> singing, singing Ramda, Ramadasa for all I think prayer things. is just fine. You know, prayer is fine and good and do it on your own and do it in a group, but, yeah. um, yeah, I don't know. Well, that... I think you've given it to us. I think I think that as a trauma survivor, your um, concern about how this yoga is used in a trauma-informed way when it's not, it's actually varying trauma. And kind of as a warning to teachers, you know, it's just really important. And I, and I think that it's a way that um, things can be pulling on the trend, but it's actually kind of um, re-traumatizing. 
And as you said, if you just called your yoga something else, but then you come in and then before you know it, you're doing a Kriya of something that could really impact yourself, you know, and it would be re-traumatizing. And a lot of times we can call ourselves all sorts of things as a somatic breath coach. You can call yourselves all sorts of things, but really are you knowing how to hold somebody in a trauma response in a particular moment? And the answer is no, because we're not trained in that. (laughs) Not at all. I mean, therapy in the teacher trainings, there were some times people were like, I'm going off my meds. And I witnessed this a few times, you know, it's like, oh, well, hold her feet, you know, and then like try to ground her, hold her feet. And they're like completely gone in a whole, like, obviously they should be back on their meds. They should complete, they should quit doing Kundalini yoga. That should be like, I'm sorry, this isn't the type of yoga for you. (laughs) <laughs> but no, it's never that. It's like, oh, this is fine. We can work this out. Like, and never like make sure you go back on your meds. But th- there would be this sort of like, well, nobody would tell you to go off your meds. That's how it's approached. Nobody would tell you to do that, even though they're really telling you to do that. That's right. That's right. Those people who have sort of a naturally ungrounded emotional space should never do Kundalini yoga that is a dangerous practice for those types of people. And I've met plenty that came through classes that I've witnessed and students along the way. So thank you for that. Anyway. Woo, this has been a really beautiful episode. Thank you for piercing us into your process, um, a very vulnerable one. And it's never Thanks easy to expose. Making sense of this crazy timeline thing. <laughs> Yeah, and I, and I think that your story really, um, it, it's such an important one because I know many of people that have used Kundalini Yoga over many decades that have uh, bypassed a really traumatic experience and we don't even know what that original one was, but somewhere in there we do because our body always remembers. And so when we do create actual safety instead of perceived safety or instead of the illusion of safety, the body will naturally feel safe enough to to uncover and to release it and and I thank you for giving us a chance to witness you finding therapy and stopping this role of of just being in the kundalini environment and pulling yourself back allowed you to claim your space and to feel more of you thank you so beautiful so beautiful thank you tell us about your song why'd you choose this song um, Sampa the Great is a Zambian woman. Um, this song is all about the celebration of feminine energy. It feels, it's, I think it's my favorite song of the year. I saw her live. I saw her performing it live in Oregon. I went to my first non Kundalini yoga festival. Like I'm, just, I'm not a festival person except for solstice. So I'll tell you what, going there and getting my camping gear up there and like hiking and I had to bring my own wagon. It was like making me appreciate all the free labor (laughs) at the summer solstice and all these happy little hippies like in the back of a pickup truck getting their trash like, oh my God, there's, they have to pay people to run these things. (laughs) So you were getting help you were from just like on your own I was like wow okay so this is what it's really like anyway I went to this awesome thing uh, called Pickathon in Oregon and she was there and I had already been a fan so I was really excited but um this is maybe one of my favorite of her songs and she's sort of a rapper and sort of a singer and this right. Love it. like beautiful magical energy that is feminine that she's bringing forward in the song is it's a good theme song love it well as always folks we don't listen to the whole song but you can listen to the uncomfortable conversations playlist on spotify so let's go ahead and listen in here as we try to share this screen
Okay, maybe not, but I'm still going to play it. And we'll go see what happens. Oh, yeah, I hear it. a great song oh my god such a great song you have just turned me on to a, a whole new great artist somebody awesome yeah she's really cool that was super well i can't say enough about this episode thank you so much um, thank you Grinishan. thank you for continuing to tell all these stories and to give a platform yeah absolutely it is um an important place and it's not easy to share out loud the kind of experiences you brought forth and I also want to say how courageous it is to pierce the lens into the normalcy of being able to talk about our, our traumatic experiences so that I, I'm not always a fan of trigger warnings because I, I feel like we need to build capacity to um, understand that triggers are a part of our life and we can't run from being a victim being a victim is a part of our life and having experiences in which we were violated doesn't mean that speaking to that victimhood um, doesn't make us anything other than we are experience right. of violation <laughs> and we can heal and to give ourselves that window of let yourself be a victim for however long it takes it, there's just nothing wrong with this and if there's just anything from this episode I, I draw that it was just it was so brilliant because the ethos of kundalini yoga 3ho even today in a lot of ex- HOers and the imprints of that, the warriorishness, the importance of finding the good in something. We don't have to work so hard to find the good. If anything, we have to work really, really hard at feeling the fucked upness of it. <laughs> feel the pain, right? Feel the rage, feel the darkness. Because what I've learned in therapy is that the silver lining comes on its own if you're willing to go into the trapped emotion of the stuff. And I think we have been overly trained in the ethos of Kundalini yoga and, and probably a lot of other spiritual spaces that says, don't be a victim, find the good. And so we bypass and we jump to forgiveness. We jump to all these other wonderful things that supposedly is more wonderful. But my experience is the pain of my body always wins. My body knows and your body knows. And so thank you for listening to your body and, and, giving us an, an, a sliver into your process. Thank you. Well, folks, this has concluded another episode of the Uncomfortable Conversations podcast, the untold stories of the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community. If you'd like to contribute to this broadcast, once again, you can make a one-time or monthly donation at gurunishan.com slash uncomfortable conversations. And if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, please send me an email at gn at gurunishan.com. And please also subscribe and um, review, rate, and follow this podcast on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll talk to you on another episode.